atheists, agnostics, skeptics uh, that promote science and, and secular values. Uh, and we like to think that we continue in the tradition of Darwin in, in challenging our everyday conceptions about the world around us and, uh, and the, the dominant ideals of, uh, of our society. So welcome to Darwin Week. Um, you'll, you'll see on your chairs that we have uh, rating cards. Uh, I really hope you'll fill those out and then put them on the table as you're leaving. Um, we really appreciate any feedback that we can get from audience members because we want next year's Darwin Week to be even better than uh, we like to think this one's, uh, this year's Darwin Week is. Uh, so uh, also if you'd like to join Unify, there's info on those cards where you can talk to the very nice people at the uh, back of the room about that. So uh, we're all here this evening, of course, to hear uh, Dr. Hector Avalos speak. Uh, Dr. Avalos is professor of religious studies at Iowa State University, where he was named Professor of the Year in 1996 and a master teacher in 2003 to 2004. He received his PhD in biblical studies from Harvard in 1991. A former fundamentalist preacher, Dr. Avalos now is widely recognized for his activism against intelligent design and for his criticism of religion. He also is the author of numerous books whose topics range from religion and science to biblical studies. His book, Fighting Words, The Origins of Religious Violence, 2005, was featured on NPR's Talk of the Nation in 2005. His next book will be about refuting the claim that reliance on the Bible led to the end of slavery. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hector Avalos. Thank you, this is about my third time speaking here, and I enjoy it every time, and I want to thank the organizers. They do a terrific job each time. They're award-winning. Uh, in their efforts. So tonight I'm going to speak to you about can science prove that prayer works? And I speak a little bit uh, from experience. See, I was a Pentecostal child evangelist who was a faith healer. Uh, many people said they were healed uh, through my prayers. And I healed everything from gum disease to cancer. Uh, if you have gum disease, please take care of it, because that was the toughest thing I ever had to deal with. Gum disease is bad. <laughs> now, if you look at prayer among Americans, you have these statistics. 64% say they pray every day, according to a Newsweek poll. 10% say they pray several times a week. 5% once a week, once or twice a month for 4%. And 1% apparently don't know whether they pray or not. <laughs> Prayer is, of course, very associated with popular televangelists like Benny Hinn, Robert Tilton, Jimmy Swaggart. Millions of dollars are spent on these evangelist ministries by people who believe that prayer does work. And in the case of these evangelists, they preach a sort of prosperity gospel where you give a little to them, and, and, and you're supposed to get more back. And there's thousands and thousands of claim healings. Each time you listen to one of their broadcasts, they will tell you. There are also some scholars and physicians who are uh, into this as well. They believe prayer can scientifically be proven to work. Uh, one of these examples is Larry Dossie, uh, author of Healing Words. And there's Harold Koenig of Duke University, who also thinks there's something to this. Now, from my experience and from my research, I think there are three reasons why people believe that prayer works and that it can scientifically be proven to work. One is false assumptions. Second, wrong information. And third is wishful thinking. And I'm going to give you examples of each of these. Here's an example of a false assumption. Um, a false assumption would be that the statistically more common event is assumed to be uncommon. So people think something is rare when something isn't. Unverifiable explanations are sometimes given for counterexamples. And then other verifiable reasons are often overlooked. So let me start by giving you two definitions of miracles before I give you a more detailed critique of that. One definition is that a miracle is an event that violates natural law. And this has, this has been critiqued by many philosophers saying, well, how do you know, for example, that natural law exists everywhere in the universe? I mean, how would you know it's uh, at the farthest end of the universe? So that's been one criticism. But another definition, and the one I will address today, is a miracle is an event directly caused by God. And so the question is, how would you identify 
an act of God. But what ties both definitions together is that they're uncommon. They, they focus on uncommon events or events that would be improbable in their mind. When I'm going to argue, they're actually not as improbable as they think. Take this example. A plane crashes on takeoff. A man survives, and then he attributes his survival to a miracle by the Christian God. Would that belief be justified? Well, not if you do a very careful statistical analysis of plane crashes. For example, take this set of plane crashes. In this set, there were no survivors and many deaths. So, for example, in Japan in 85, a JL Boeing 747 crashed, 520 people died, no one survived. Same thing in uh, Scotland in 1221-88, the Pan Am Boeing 747 blown up, no one survived. So if you go by that statistic, you say, well, yeah, surviving would be very odd, very statistically miraculous. But take a look at our second set of plane crashes. In this case, uh, you have many survivors. So, for example, in 85 at Dallas, Delta L10-111 crashed. You had 135 deaths and 30 survivors. You go to Iowa in 89, you actually have more survivors than you have deaths. And if you look at the Hudson River landing, if you want to call it a crash, well, there were no deaths. Everybody survived. Now, what is the difference between the first set I showed you and the second set I showed you? You know what it is? Altitude. How high you're up in the air that determines whether you're going to live or die. If your plane drops from a very high altitude, explodes from a very high altitude, probably you're going to get zero survivors. If your plane crashes near takeoff or landing, you're going to get survivors. It has nothing to do with prayer. It has everything to do with how high you're up in the air. Now, so the corrected assumption would be most airplane accidents near takeoff and landing are survivable. There are often more survivors than dead in those cases. And the same holds true for passengers of all religions. So if you go to India, you'll get the same statistics. You go to China full of communists, same statistics. <laughs> Go to Harvard Divinity Full. Harvard Divinity School full of atheists. Same statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Here are more questions for those who believe that science can prove prayer works. Can an all-powerful God only save people near takeoff or landing? Can God save people who fall from high altitudes? Does God enjoy seeing people drop in? <laughs> Is God unable to disarm bombs? After all, you know, why should a bomb pose a problem for an omnipotent God? Here's another question I have. <laughs> why do people wear helmets when they go skydiving? Do they really help that much? I mean, it's very high up in the fall. Here's another example. A battle survivor. He says a man goes into battle, prays to survive, and he does survive. Would that be miraculous? Would that even be uncommon? Well, <clears throat> the erroneous assumption is that surviving is rarer than dying in such battles. But <clears throat> if you look at statistics of war, it's the opposite. Here in the Korean War, you had 105,000 wounded, 33,000 killed. In other words, more wounded than killed. You don't have to die if you were wounded. That's the opposite. See, the correct assumption is most people do survive battles. It's dying that's more unusual. So if you're going to call a miracle, it's a miracle when everybody dies in a, in a war or in a battle. <laughs> and we can even do this with dummies. Just play some dummies in a battlefield will also result in some dummies being unharmed. You can target practice with dummies, and it'll leave a few unharmed when placed in a battlefield condition. 
Some dummies will be behind protective walls or in foxholes or listening to Fox News. <laughs> so whatever you do, if you use dummies and put them in the same battlefield condition, you're going to get the same statistics as with human beings. Now you're going to say the dummies that survive is the ones that prayed? No. It's just what the battlefield does. So now what about these scientific studies of prayer? Now, these are a little harder to critique because you think these are, and, and is this on? It's, uh, Can it break anything? <laughs> Can somebody pray for this place? <laughs> This is the Randolph Bird study done at the University of San Francisco and published in 1988 in a very scientifically sounding journal. Positive effects of therapeutic, uh, positive therapeutic effects of intercessory prayer in a coronary care unit population. Southern Medical Journal, 1988. And what he did was, um, he's a cardiologist at uh, University of San Francisco. He took 393 patients, 192 of them were prayed for, 200 and 201 were not prayed for. Then he compared the results. The results in the prayed for group showed that they were five times less likely to develop pulmonary edema, fluid in their lungs, none required intubation, and fewer patients died. Those are the ones that were prayed for. That sounds impressive. But once you look at the statistics and you say, what, what does less people die mean? Well, it really means 13 in the prayed for group died versus 17 in the non prayed for group. 7% versus 8.5% of a difference, which isn't very much. You know, uh, a better study called the STEP study was done in 2006. And by the way, um, Randolph Bird study said it was prayer not to anything, but specifically to the Judeo-Christian God. But here's the step study of 2006, uh, performed by Dr. Herbert Benson of the Harvard Medical School uh, with Templeton Foundation money. And he studied coronary artery, artery bypass grafts. And he said any prayer lasted for 14 days after this graft surgery. Now he studied three groups of patients, not two like the previous study. One group, 604, received prayer and were told they may or may not receive prayer. So you receive the prayer, but you weren't told whether you were prayed for or not. 601 received prayer and were told they would receive prayer. So somebody came up and said, yeah, you're the one being prayed for. 597 did not receive prayer and we're told they may or may not receive prayer. And the results were these. 52% of those who received uncertain prayers suffered complications. 51% of those who did not receive prayer <laughs> suffered complications. But it was 59% of the patients who were certain of receiving prayer that had complications. In other words, Intercessory prayer itself had no effect on complication-free recovery from these bypass grafts. But certainty of receiving intercessory prayer was associated with a higher incidence of complications. So if you were to go by that study, the more you were prayed for, the more problems you're going to have. But here's the problem with all studies. <laughs> The problem is very simple in scientific methodology is there can be no such thing as a control group for prayer studies because it is not possible to show that someone did not receive prayer. What if you had some crazy aunt in the basement praying for all sick people in the world? How would you then would, would be able to separate those that did not receive prayer if someone's praying for everybody? How would you know that? And of course, my great insight was quoted in science 
the primary journal of science. <laughs> Therefore, since a control group is not possible, then a controlled scientific study of prayer is not possible. There is no such thing as a scientific study. But there can't be. See that? Now, there's also a supernatural circularity at work with these prayer studies. See, supernatural usually means not natural. But one cannot recognize something not natural with the natural senses or logic. To say something is not natural is to claim near omniscience because one would be claiming that we know all possible natural causes that might exist, and we are affirming that none of those was the cause of the event we witnessed. Otherwise, supernatural is just a meaningless term. I don't know what people mean when they say that. Now, here is an example. Here, previously, I showed you examples of just assumptions about statistics that are not right. Here is where wrong information leads patients to believe prayer works. As a child faith healer, and I actually did this from uh, about the age of seven to about the age of 18, people would come to me and said, I have a kidney problem. <coughs> and I said, well, why do you think you have a kidney problem? Well, because I have a backache. And then I would pray for them and the backache would go away. They would report my kidney problem went away. In other words, they didn't know enough about you know, their anatomy, to know that a backache doesn't always signify a kidney problem. They call it a kidney problem, even though it's just a regular old backache. So they're going to believe they were healed of a kidney problem when that backache goes away. It's just wrong information. The other thing is, which is almost impossible to believe, doctors can be wrong. I know, I'm a doctor. <laughs> Patient, for example, will report that a doctor gave him a few months to live. Then the patient lives a prediction, and then the patient assumes the doctor could not have been wrong. And therefore, he attributes this to a miracle. So, um, actually that happened to me. I was given two years to live at one point. That was, I was supposed to die in 1988. Here I am, 2011. Most patients actually receive both medical help and prayer. Which means, it's not possible to distinguish the effects of the medical treatment from the effects of prayer. So a lot of people that receive both conventional treatment and prayer often say, oh, you see, I prayed and uh, I was healed from my cancer. They don't tell you that they also had cancer treatment at the same time. <laughs> you know, why isn't it the cancer treatment did it? Why is it the prayer treatment did it? And the third reason I gave was wishful thinking. People want to believe that prayer works. And I say that because uh, a man named Mansell Pedersen, a medical anthropologist, studied 71 reported healings in Seattle. And he found that patients reported being healed even when their symptoms had not disappeared. So, you know, they, they were still, you know, the amputee still was an amputee. But yet, what's reporting, you know, somehow God has, is helping me. Or their <clears throat> symptoms of cancer have not disappeared, but somehow they'll, they'll report, God is helping. What is that? Well, that's wishful thinking, because it does not conform to reality. And here's another thing that the scientists who believe that prayer works and can prove it scientifically, they're often not very good theologians. They don't know enough theology or biblical studies to understand that what they are claiming to prove is not even biblically based sometimes. For example, as I said, Dr. Bird, the San Francisco cardiologist, attributes any answered prayers specifically to the biblical Judeo-Christian God. But the fact is the Bible can have very different ideas about prayer Bird is a poor biblical scholar. Let me give you an example. If you read the Bible, God does not always want to answer prayers. In Isaiah 115, it says, When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. 
your hands are full of blood. So under some circumstances, God won't answer prayers. Now, how does Randolph Bird know in which mood God is in today, you know, for his study? How does he know what he thinks of the U.S. at that point? And Jeremiah 11, 14 says, actually, you shouldn't even pray for some people. As for you, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf. For I will not listen when they call to me in their time of trouble. So how would Randolph Bird control for that variable if he's doing a prayer study scientifically? How would he read the mind of God on that day? <clears throat> Again, a miracle in a Christian definition of Charles Hodge, 19th century Protestant theologian, says, a miracle therefore may be defined to be an event in the external world brought about by the immediate efficiency or simple volition of God. It's a miracle because God did it. But the question remains, how would you prove scientifically God did it? We have to think a little bit deeper about this because you see, in order to know that any being caused any event, you first have to know that being exists. It would be illogical to say, I know being X caused Y, but I don't know if being X exists. That's like saying, I don't know if undetectable Martians exist, but I do know that they lit my pants on fire. <laughs> it's not possible to know the Christian God exists because he is an infinite being with infinite attributes. For example, he's supposed to be everywhere in the universe at the same time. He's always existed and will always exist. But human beings are finite creatures who cannot know if there's a being everywhere in the universe at the same time. Because we are not everywhere in the universe at the same time. To verify this is true. Human beings have not always existed. And so we can't verify that there's a being who has always existed. How would we know? So since it's not logically possible to say God performed a healing unless you know that the agent who performed it the healing was eternal, everywhere at the same time, etc. One can never attribute any of that witness to God. It's a logical impossibility. <clears throat> and what if Krishna did all this? There's another part where Randolph Byrd is too religiocentric. He's only focused on proving that Judeo-Christian God answers prayer. But actually, if you read the Bhagavad Gita 7.22, it says, it does not matter which God man worship. It is I who answer that prayer. So even if you were healed by calling on Jesus, what the Bhagavad Gita is saying to you, it wasn't Jesus, it was really Krishna. But you're too dumb to know it was me. So I let you believe. See? Now how would you scientifically prove it was really Krishna and not Jesus or vice versa? How would you do it? And think about it some more. Let's suppose that a super doctor lived in your home. Imagine the best doctor that ever lived, you know, was right in your home. And that doctor could cure any illness instantaneously. Would you expect that doctor to help a child if he's choking? And sees that child choking? Would you need to ask him first? to help and he sees the child choking. If you were a good person, then we would expect the doctor to help immediately without request being made of him. He would just act, right? Similarly, see, an all good God would not want a child to suffer. An all powerful God could stop the suffering immediately. An omnipresent God is present in every home. An all-knowing God would know the child would be ill before it happened. Therefore, if the Christian God exists, illness would not exist. Prayer would be unnecessary because the illness would not exist in the first place. He would know and take care of it ahead of time. 
Can science prove prayer works? No, did you not listen to me? <laughs> well, what's wrong with believing? Well, for one, people may die because of faith. There's wasted money and resources. You know how many billions of dollars are spent on these ministries? That money could be used to lower your taxes, let's say, or fix roads. Third, mythological beings don't help people. People help people. And that's why investing your time and energy in beings that may not be there to help you is only going to result in more trouble. And here's some further reading if you're interested. It's a book called When Prayer Fails by Sean Francis Peters. He actually uses a lot of my arguments. Uh, and it's an excellent survey of the legal issues. I haven't touched on those, but there are legal issues as to, you know, can you allow somebody not to receive a blood transfusion because they're Jehovah's Witnesses? Can you allow someone not to deny insulin to their child because of their religious belief? Should you do that? So those are just some of the questions that we can begin to ponder, you know, once you see you cannot scientifically prove that prayer works. Now, I want to play something for you here. Let's see if it's working. This year, one thing I, I started doing for the first time was I actually started playing guitar. I learned how to play the guitar, and uh, I'm going to just play something for you right now. I, uh, I'm, a big fan of, I'm a big fan of music, so like when, uh, when I'm driving on road trips and stuff, I'll always, always listen to the radio, and I'll listen to Christian rock uh, by mistake. <laughs> Because it only starts out as like a Bon Jovi ballad, you know? It'll be like, I woke up in the morning, and I got myself some oatmeal, and I put some raisins on it, and Christ is God, Christ is God, 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 God. And I'm like, what about the oatmeal? I don't know if this is the oatmeal song. I feel like every religion should have their own rock and roll, you know? Like, there should be Jewish rock. Like, I woke up in the morning, and I got myself some lox and bagels, and I put some cream cheese on them, and Christ isn't God. He's just not God. He's a really nice guy, but don't get carried away. Atheist rock, like, I woke up in the morning and I got myself a whole box of cinnamon toast crunch. Cause I just don't care anymore. And there is no God. Sorry about that. Your grandma's in the ground and her soul staying there. Oh man, that is some dark ass atheist rock. <laughs> I wonder what DC would be. What would, uh, I guess an agnostic rock? Like, I woke up in the morning and I got myself some organic wheat puffs and I put some soy milk on them and there might be a God. There's really no way to know. He might be a fish or he might be a spoon. Mike. All I wanted was a song about oatmeal. Uh, the artist by the name uh, is Mike Birbiglia. Uh, it's a great, it's a great little multi 
viewpoint approach to religion. All right, are there any questions? Uh, any questions? Yes. And the second study you quoted, where they had the large populations, three, the difference is, just looking at them, uh, didn't appear to be statistically significant. Was there a significance test run to see if they were uh, act through to chance or not? Do you, I don't know whether you recall that or not. <clears throat> he thought he ran enough tests to tell you that most of the people that would pray for and knew they would pray for 15 uh, percent had more problems or, or had problems versus. Oh, okay, he said yeah. he did do it. Yeah, I read that study and I believe they were not statistically significant. Yeah, he, even that 59 percent. Yeah, 59 percent versus. Yeah. That's way it looks. It was today. not. It was, okay. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think Herbert Benson. I, I'm a critic of Herbert Benson as well. In, in that science article, I criticized his methodology. Uh, he was at the very least the proof that doesn't make, confer any advantage, statistically. Yes, sir, in fact. Well, we don't got answers to all prayers. The answer is usually no. Could, could you speak louder, please? Because we don't got answers to all prayers. The answer is usually no. You're talking about the uh, thing Bertrand Russell said, you know, the prayer such an application, you went to Fatima. He says, all you use crutches and canes, not a single wooden leg. So how do religious groups answer that question? How do you answer people that go to that place? No, and what Bertrand Russell said, he went there to visit. And you go there and it's racks and you know, oh, yeah, yeah. and canes. Yeah. There's not a single wooden leg. Okay. So, I mean, God, you want to go or what? I'm just trying to answer what um, you You can study that historically, too. If you go to the Asclepius temples, of uh, the Greek god of healing, Asclepius, actually, you can trace that tradition of leaving materials uh, to reflect healings back to those temples. And if the Asclepius temples, you, you actually had testimonia. They were posted on the, uh, uh, on the temple itself, and they gave you the name of the person, where he was from, and what they were healed of. So they, they were keeping better records than, say, what you find in the Gospels, where sometimes just a blind man, or they, they don't tell you where, where are you from, where can we find you, anything like that. Uh, and I've also studied the Medjugorje, uh, which are even newer than Fatima. Uh, that started in uh, June 24, 1981, uh, in what used to be old Yugoslavia. And some of the healings there have very common threads. But there you can actually have, you have videotape of people saying things like, I see the sun dancing, I see the sun coming closer when the video shows nothing about it. Which shows you again that people can report seeing things that are not occurring. People can report seeing things that don't happen. You know, we can prove that scientifically. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. If I may follow up on that, I, I, I think the, the point was uh, there were no amputees healed. No, no, there never are. <laughs> that was the part of the yeah, yeah. point. Yeah. But, but uh, what I'm saying is, in the Asclepius Temple, they have the same issue. Yeah. You know, th there were amputee legs up there in, in, in Asclepius Temples as well. I can actually do a healing miracle for you if you want me to, with, with a leg. If, if, if anyone wants to volunteer, I can make your leg, uh, uneven legs even. If anybody wants to volunteer, I can do it. Can I get another one? You can. <laughs> See you after. <laughs> yes? Um, this is kind of a more personal question. How did you, what made you turn from your faith? <clears throat> Reading the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a whole article how, it's called How Bible Study Made an Unbeliever Out of Me. So, very briefly, I, I grew up in a Pentecostal family in Mexico. Came to the U.S. because my grandmother was a housekeeper and I lived with her. She brought me for company. And we were members of a Pentecostal church that believed in healing, prayer, and, and faith healing. And so I started to do that because I thought, you know, help you. And um, when I was about 13 or so, a Jehovah's Witness came to my door and I thought I knew my Bible, and he told me, well, your Bible is not translated properly, and so everything you're telling me about 
you believe in the Trinity, uh, which they deny, um, is wrong. And I said, well, gosh, I thought I knew my Bible. Now I have to go learn Greek and Hebrew and all that. Well, that's what I did. And um, I was very poor at that time and couldn't go to Hebrew school. So what I did was I mowed lawns and got myself a Hebrew grammar, a Hebrew dictionary, uh, and a Hebrew Bible. And I taught myself Hebrew, and Greek, and all that. So I started to learn the arguments of the other side to defeat atheists. And so I really wanted to learn you know, how this came about and defend my Bible. But in the process, I started to find out that actually the evidence I thought was there was not there. You know, for the historicity of many things, and eventually, I, I said, you know, there's no evidence that this book is of divine origin. There's no evidence that Christianity is of divine origin. And eventually I saw no religion as evidence for its supernatural claims. And so I realized I was an atheist uh, at that point. But, but it started with Bible study. Yes? What do you define as the purpose of prayer from a Christian outlook? Could you uh, say that louder, please? What do you define as the purpose of prayer as defined by the Bible? The purpose of prayer? Yeah. Well, it, it has many purposes. A lot of people you know, think it actually will help them. Others, if you want to look, look at it more sociologically or psychologically, I think a lot of people are talking to themselves, and, and not in a derogatory way. I think that a lot of people are expressing their hopes and wishes for what their life is going to be like. You know, if you're sick, you want to be well. And so, uh, if you don't believe in the supernatural, you know, the way I look at people praying is, they're simply expressing what they would idealize as, as, as the future or their condition or the condition of their loved ones. Yes? Do you believe that prayer can help in a way that it's like a self-affirmation? Like they kind of tell themselves or they believe that God will help them somehow? In, in part, it could be, yeah. I, I wouldn't say that you know prayer is always going to hurt you. I would just say that the concept of, of, of appealing to a being that you don't know it's there, it, it's, it's in general like not the best thing. You know, if you're, you're going to solve a problem, you've got to do it with real causes and, and, and consequences, not mythological beings that may not be there. You know, only people help people. And, and, and I'm going to say, I, I've been on the other side. You know, I, uh, when I was um, a sophomore in college, I developed um, a very serious illness called Wagner Schwanomatosis, which um, nearly killed me. And I told you, they gave me two years to live at one point because of it. And I realized that what helped me, because a lot of, a lot of people thought, oh, he's going to come back to Christianity, right? There's this myth that there are no atheists in foxholes. Have you heard that? <laughs> well, I was near death many, many times. Never did I come back. And the reason is I realized that mythological beings are not going to help me. Only people help me. What help me, and the, the reason I'm better is medical science. That's the very I saw. One day I was sick. The next day I was in the hospital. After hospital treatment, I was better. That's the variable I saw. You know, I, God had been there. He was not a variable because he, uh, he was there all the while, supposedly. So my healing has to focus on what was different. What was different was medical science, not prayer, not anything else. Yes? Um, so where do you stand, or this goes along with healing and miracles, what about the healings and miracles that Jesus what about the miracles Jesus did? Yeah. Well, that assumes Jesus did any miracles. I don't accept the premise that Jesus did any miracles. And why don't you? Because um, the reports of his miracles are not corroborated or verified by any independent sources. And you have to realize that in general for Jesus, we have no sources, zero sources from his time. We have none. Every manuscript we have the earliest manuscript we have of, of the New Testament is P52, comes from about 125. And then everything you have from Luke and, and Matthew is really like third and fourth centuries. So how would you verify that somebody, 
a text written in the fourth century has any accurate information about something that happened in the third, how would you do it? You can't unless you have other corroborating evidence, and we don't, see? The second reason is you also have similar accounts of other Roman figures performing miracles. For example, the Emperor Vespasian, who um, became emperor in 69, he's said to have healed uh, a blind man by putting spittle on him, the same technique used by Jesus in Mark 8, 22 and on. So, uh, and in the case of Vespasian, we have at least three sources that said that he did that. So, why would you accept that Jesus did miracles on the basis of three or four sources in some cases, and not accept that Vespasian did miracles on the basis of three sources? You see? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, it seemed to me that the conclusion of your <coughs> presentation was that science cannot prove that prayer doesn't work. Do you conclude that science, science cannot prove prayer works? Yeah. Do you can you conclude the opposite? <clears throat> no, um, not really. But that's not a good way to approach things. For example, I cannot scientifically prove that undetectable Martians don't exist. What matters is science is what is not what you can disprove is, is is there. What matters is your belief has to be based on evidence for the belief. You see? So I don't believe in anything for which I have no evidence. But um, so I don't have evidence, for example, for the existence of Zeus. Zeus is irrelevant to my life. No one would say, well, do you have any proof that Zeus doesn't exist? No, that would not make him relevant anyway. It's only proof for Zeus' existence that makes something relevant to my life. See? So do you believe that uh, all faith in anything, uh, <coughs> everything is um, irrelevant, is, should not be used? No, not necessarily, but I'm just saying, I am not going to appeal to Zeus without knowing, without having any evidence that he works or does anything. You know, it, it makes no more sense than say, I am going to pray to an undetectable Martian to heal me. You know, I can't disprove undetectable Martians don't exist or can't prove that they don't. But I wouldn't do it that way. You don't operate that way. That's not a scientific way to operate. Yes. Uh, in your study of uh, the Bible, <coughs> did, do you feel that the primary purpose of prayer is is for what you're analyzing, whether it's uh, healing or it, it seems like your uh, your analysis was primarily on healing or preventing mm -hmm. bad things from happening? Did you, did you conclude that that from your study of Scripture that no that prayer has many purposes, and, and you have to talk. You're talking about from the believers' viewpoint, right? Because, well, see, the insider, his view of the purpose of prayer is going to be different from the outsider. You know, I see him as talking to himself. I see him as expressing wishes. The insider doesn't see it that way. So what I see as his purpose is not what he sees as his purpose. But in general, if you ask believers, well, why do you pray? Well, it's usually the same thing. They want to solve a problem. They want to express some, some kind of... Um, love for their deity, or they feel they have an obligation. So some, in some religions, you're obliged to pray a certain number of times, for example. So there's all sorts of reasons why people pray. And so, if I can follow that up, I, my, I guess my question was, if you're talking about the Judeo-Christian God, um, and these people claim to be uh, Christians mm -hmm. in that sense, if they're not praying a lot, if their prayers aren't congruent with how the Bible describes mm -hmm. prayer. Right. Um, it, it doesn't. It, I guess it doesn't seem like it follows that. Well, they're not doing it the way that the Bible prescribes it, and so it, it's ineffective. Therefore, it, no. What I'm saying is, Randolph Bird, in his effort to prove that he can scientifically establish that prayer works, he is not accounting for some of the problems that the Bible would pose for him. And one of them is that the biblical God, and he says specifically he is praying to the biblical God. The biblical God says he doesn't always answer prayers. So my question is, how would Randall Bird account for that in a scientific study? Well, he can't. He can't know what God is feeling like on that day. You know, 
Because in the Bible, God's mood does affect whether he answers prayer or not. How he feels about you affects how he answers prayer. So my question is a critique of Bird's methodology. How do you account for that fact in the Bible, in your study? See, he doesn't. Let's see, yes. Can somebody put a microphone on the people? I can, I can barely hear them. Is there another microphone? Can somebody? Wanna move up so you can hear Yeah, move up. So my question was, uh, this lecture was mostly about Christian, Christian God. And there are also other religions, atheists, and why do you think? So why do you think uh, there exist in the world, like from centuries to centuries, um, like different religions exist? Um, what do you think the reason is? What is the reason? Do you think? What is the reason that yeah. different religions exist? exist. Oh, why do religions, religions exist? exist? Yeah. Because the common um, <clears throat> the commonality is the human brain and the human experience. In other words, uh, people around the world have similar needs and wants, for example. People get ill around the world. Uh, people may be hungry around the world. People may have problems, but do have problems around the world. So they tend to solve them in similar ways, you know, in some cases. And religion has been one of the ways that people have tried to solve their problems. Um, there's a 